Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us for our uh, uh, session in the Talks in Chinese Humanities series today. Before we get started, I would just like to acknowledge um, that I'm speaking from Gadigal land and pay my respects to elders past and present. So my name is Minerva Inwald. I'm Judith Nielsen Postdoctoral Fellow in Contemporary Art at the University of New South Wales in Sydney. Um, I'm hosting today our, uh, one of our talks in the series, Talks in Chinese Humanities, that's a collaborative project co-presented by the Chinese Studies Center um, and the Discipline of Chinese Studies at the, at the University of Sydney, as well as the Australian Society for Asian Humanities um, and the Faculty of Art, Design and Architecture at UNSW. Um, I'm very happy to say that today we have Professor Antonia Finnain presenting in the series. Um, so Professor Finnain is an um, honorary professorial fellow in the School of Historical and Philosophical Studies at the University of Melbourne. A historian of China, she held teaching and uh, a teaching and research appointment at the University of Melbourne for 30 years before her retirement um, and continues to supervise PhD students um, at the University of Melbourne. She is the 2006 winner of the Joseph Levinson Book, Prize, a book Award for a work on pre 20th century China uh, for her book, Speaking of Yangzhou, A Chinese City, 1550 to 1850, which was published with Harvard East Asian Monographs. Um, and has since been reissued twice in Chinese translation. Her latest book is How to Make a Mao Suit, Clothing, in the, uh, Clothing the People of Communist China, 1949 to 1976, which has been published this year with Cambridge University Press. Um, and uh, we have a discount code for the book as well that I'll pop in the chat during the talk. Um, so uh, Professor Finane will present, um, and then there'll be an opportunity for questions at the end. If you have questions, you can put them in the Q&A box that's uh, um, at the bottom of the screen. Uh, you can put those in during the chat um, or at the end during the Q&A session. Okay, so I'm now uh, very happy to hand over to Professor Finane for her talk, Communist China as Closed Community, Insights from Dress in the Mao Years. Thank you. Thanks very much for that introduction uh, maneuver. It's uh, lovely to be back in Sydney remotely. I'm actually in Taipei at the moment, but I have lived for many years in Melbourne, but I did start off in Sydney and indeed I began studying Chinese in the then Department of Oriental Studies under Professor Davis and his crew. Uh, yes, so uh, as Minerva uh, remarked, I uh, started off my serious research and uh, publication in the uh, Mingqing period, but I've moved forward into the 20th century. And this book has taken me deep into uh, a period of uh, history that also covers my own early life and indeed I was one of the Whitlam era exchange students in China in the 1970s. And it's strange to have lived so long now that my own photographs, which appear in the book, are historical photographs. I'm going to go to uh, share my PowerPoint uh, now. So just be patient with me for one minute and we'll be into the serious matter of the day. So I began writing this book in response to the question, how did a very large, very poor country in the middle of the 20th century so quickly change from wearing long gowns to wearing jackets and trousers? How is the fabric supplied in an era of shortages? How did so many people so quickly acquire the technical expertise to make clothes of such a different nature? Sometimes 
people argued then and still argue that jacket and the jacket and trousers uh, was much more were much more practical garments than, for example, the long gown, which was uh, usually worn by men of any standing in the towns. While the tailored look of jacket and trousers sewn in the Western style was more suited to the contemporary world and a new China than the old fashioned Chinese jacket and trousers. But the answer seems not to lie in functionality or really in fashion. Rather, we can see in the rapid standardization of dress in China cities and towns, the formation of a solidary community in which dress was both a sign of the community and the mechanism for creating it. There are several iterations of community that could be thought about here. For example, Bourdieu's community of taste, very obvious for this topic. Uh, Wenger's community of practice would be another. But I started thinking about a closed community by analogy because dress is so often discussed in relationship to the boundary formed around a closed community and to the internal structure of the community, particularly the gender and family structure. A closed community is a distinct community existing within a host society with which it does not intermarry. So examples would be the Amish in the US, their dress, quote, often sewn at home of inexpensive material, signaling equality and frugality, much the same as could be said of China in the era I am talking about. The Holderman Mennonites with their emphasis on plain dress as, quote, the external manifestation of inner attitudes, again, very appropriate to the Chinese context. Again, comparatively speaking, the ultra-Orthodox in Israel are interesting um, because male dress codes in particular mark a deviation from the prevailing order. Uh, in China, such an account would fit precisely the determined self-differentiation of Chinese uh, men or the personification of the Chinese man in Mao Zedong, determined self-differentiation from men in suits. And that was made very clear by Mao when he had to have new clothes made for him for the founding of the People's Republic of China in 1949. And those new clothes, despite advice from his advisors, was not going to be a Western suit. So, albeit on a vastly expanded scale, I feel that China in the Mao era, in retrospect, looks rather like one of those closed communities. It sought to remain aloof in a world on which it continued to be dependent. Hence this photo here in the middle of the Cultural Revolution of the crowd outside the Canton Trade Fair in 1967. The uh, the window to the outside world, you know, the, the, the engine for import and export. Um, clothing in this society was a collective and bounded system that reflected and also imposed a certain social order. It was ideally simple, frugal and neatly fitting, terms steadily in use through the Ma years. And rising anxieties about dress were a hallmark of Chinese society in the early years of the reform era, when this closed community was beginning to open up. So to just touch briefly on the question of endogamous marriage uh, in relationship to the, uh, to the closed community as a marrying community, as long as movement in and out of China was limited by Cold War barriers, nationally endogamous marriage was not an especially obvious feature of Chinese society. That is, of course, it was endogamous, but it could be sort of just by accident. It did become very clear when China became, began to open up again that this was a marrying boundary that had been constructed because Sino-foreign romances became international incidents. 
In 1981, Li Xuang engaged to marry French diplomat Emmanuel Belfort, was arrested for offending against the dignity of Chinese society, imprisoned for nearly two years. There's enormous contretemps also around the marriages of Australian Susan Day and uh, Judith Sapira with their Chinese partners. Not only was the clothing regime bounded spatially, that is, people inside dressed in one way and people outside in another, it was also bookended temporarily. This closed community, in other words, identifies Marx and the historical period. In the book, I argue that the change of clothing was deeply cultural and consistent with an old adage, when the dynasty changed, the clothing was altered. This does not mean that the very farmers in the fields began dressing differently, but rather new protocols would be issued for robes of state and the servants of state, and there were flow on effects for the rest of society. Now, the Communist Party rejected such attitudes as feudal, but could not destroy the cultural logic that underpinned them. And when it came to power, it precipitated a general change in clothing culture. The change was inadvertent, but decisive. Elements in the new national wardrobe were recognizably a legacy of earlier times, but the rupture with the past was absolute in sartorial terms. The clothes people wore in the Mao years were distinctive. Wearing them, people showed their membership of the new order, and when they ceased to wear them in the 1980s, when they began to cease to wear them, it was a sign that the order was changing. I argue too that the whole clothing system was pivoted on what foreigners came to call the Mao suit, or in Chinese, the Zhong Shan Zhuang and its many variants. From Mao's decision about, about what to wear at the Declaration of the People's Republic in 1949, much followed the popularity of the suit, its association with Mao himself and the, and the CCP, its status in the hierarchical order of the party and the wider society, its masculinity, its costliness, its ritual character all gave it prestige. Like its counterpart, the Western suit, it's a powerful garment located at the core of a particular vestimentary order. And it was the blueprint for a variety of suits that differed from each other in minor ways, but together constituted the category of durful or uniforms. In the book, I use the term durful because of its distinctive connotations in the Chinese context, rather than uniform, which has a different set of meanings in English. So, how did this come about? The photo here showing replicas of the Zhongshan suit worn by Mao, Hu Jintao, Zhou Enlai and others, there's seven in all in this display, is in the Ningbo Museum of Costume, uh, south of Shanghai, uh, uh, devoted largely to the red tailors, the Hongbang, who were central to the development and dissemination of Western style tailoring skills in 20th century China. And I should emphasize that we're, what we're looking at here is not just a different style of clothing with a different aesthetic, but it's a material object that required new techniques and often new materials to assemble. And much as we think of this, you know, as in association with Mao's China, it was in fact, you know, basically a, a Western technique of making and uh, Western and uh, originally Western structure of clothing that we're beholding in this period. The history begins well before 1949. Communist China had a precedent in nationalist China. As a vestimentary regime, the party state of the PRC had important features with its predecessor. And one of those was the shared human resources, which were included the red group tailors. 
The Red Group tailors were masters of Western tailoring in the former treaty ports and especially in Shanghai. And the map here shows the density of their presence in uh, Shanghai in the first half of the 20th century. The story of the Zhongshan suit takes various forms, but most do involve the Red Group. Their history shows how techniques mastered to make the Western suit during the treaty ports era were used to make Jirifu, first for the dress of officials in the nationalist regime, and then for officials and everyone else in the Mao years. And they have quite the cultural standing down in Ningbo. Uh, the other part of picture on this slide shows uh, a steely erected at one of the villages in Ningbo that was the uh, birthplace, the old hometown of a particular set of these Ningbo tailors. The transformation of tailoring entailed new technologies, new tools, new materials. Pre-industrial sewing techniques and tools do show a lot of shared terrain between China and Europe. So items such as scissors and needles and measuring rules were essentially similar. But under the impact of cultural and technological change in the late 19th and early 20th century, even those two things that were more or less identical were gradually displaced and changed by their changed into and replaced by their uh, European forms, and a range of entirely new items entered into the realm of tailoring. These include buttons, safety pins, belt hooks, and, and tape measures, which all of which flowed into the treaty ports from suppliers in Germany, Britain, and Japan, and they stimulated new local industries in China. So this changed, you know, tool assemblage in the tailor's workshop in the first half of the 20th century points to a large scale reconfiguration of clothing uh, production underway in these years, ahead of the visible transformation of dress in the Mao years. And if we compare these uh, photos, of these images, we can see, for example, the snake headed uh, scissors of the old dispensation replaced by the sewing shears in the new, the old uh, charcoal filled iron still in use uh, right through to the middle of the 20th century, but now uh, accompanied by the electric iron and the sewing machine, of course, to which we will return. The enormous variety of buttons, buttons became, came to be uh, a sign of, uh, associated with particular uh, fashions. You bought nice buttons for particular sorts of clothes, uh, but created the technological challenge of how to make a buttonhole. After 1949, the Western suits produced by the Red Group tailors were uh, quite quickly uh, and replaced by the Jewful. These were made with the same tailoring techniques and at the upper end of bespoke tailoring, they were made by the same tailors, quickly replacing the long gown as a dress for men in urban contexts, as well as the Western suit, which hung around a bit longer. It has been said, including by me, that there were no official laws or regulations uh, governing uh, dress for the whole country, but I find that protocols governing work dress did constitute a regulatory system. The reorganisation of the workforce under the under party rule, under Communist Party rule, provided an administrative framework within which making and wearing jiruful was both encouraged and expected. Once major institutions in education, communications and industry were taken over by the new state, we could expect that the dress protocols for the staff in all these areas would show similarities across the spectrum of workplaces. And so it was. Then once planning 
prioritise the production of Jufu to clothe all these people in the increasing number of occupations that were under, uh, within the remit of the state, then the domination of the clothing supply by Jufu was assured. And here uh, in this, in the left-hand image, we can see the various uh, forms that were assumed uh, by this basic uh, pattern uh, for different sorts of occupation. Jufu is a term much more closely associated with men's wear than women's, but women's work in the Mao years did include making Jufu. There was uh, massive recruitment of women into the workforce and into vocational training in the 1950s. And women in various contexts, in factories, sewing co-ops, and especially in their homes, became significant agents in the production of this new national wardrobe. So in much of rural China, women did continue to spin the yarn, weave the cloth, make the clothes and shoes for all their family members. So they were reproducing a material culture not too different from that of preceding generations, although over time we can see not entirely the same either. But in the towns, a new material culture was created, much of it at the hands of women. The gendering of sewing come uh, the sewing come tailoring industry was pronounced. That is, uh, the, the, the government, the authorities did not want men uh, in sewing rooms. They wanted them doing the sort of the muscular work of heavy industry. So recruitment uh, into uh, sewing schools was early on limited uh, to women uh, who also steadily uh, came to dominate the staff of the fledgling uh, light industry of ready-made clothing. And a light in, uh, an, an industry, I should uh, remark, that remained very, very small until the 1980s. It's difficult to identify a peak period of efficiency for the system of clothing production developed during the Mao years but it did have chronic inefficiencies. These can be contributed in some part to cotton rationing. Shortages of cotton cloth and, of course, cotton thread were virtually guaranteed through a combination of problems in the agrarian sector and priority given to exports in the trade sector. Fabric shortages led to a seemingly interminable cycle of patching and recycling clothes. There were constant refrains of, you know, supply failing to meet demand and getting clothes made is difficult. There were some creative responses to shortages, but rationing also meant the clothes had to be worn for years on end. People often had only their work clothes to wear. So the rationing system, which was introduced just as the Jufu regime was beginning to take shape, were, were actually instrumental in consolidating this regime. The challenge faced by women in learning to sew Western-style gar garments are clear to the eye from patterns like these. There were patterns for Chinese as well as Western-style trousers in some, but very few, but some pattern books showing that a sustained, there was a sustained need for a use of Chinese-style clothes. But the pattern for Chinese-style trousers, for example, you can see it's very simple, while that for Western-style trousers is complicated. In general, the country was moving from making and wearing loose-fitting Chinese-style garments with their approximate measurements made with large stitches for easy unpicking and turning to complicated garments with many parts, collars, pockets, pocket flaps, trousers cut differently front and back, 
belt loops, buttons in profusion, buttonholes to match. And because they were more or less fitted, they required tight stitching so that the seams did not burst. So this challenge continued to be met by hand sewing in very many instances over a long period of time, but both for industry purposes, because China was already exporting ready-made clothing in the 1950s, and for homemade clothing, a sewing machine industry was important and was indeed fostered almost from scratch. Before 1949, most sewing machines were imported. They were Singer sewing machines, although um, Japanese machines had a growing market that was in fact sustained for quite a long period after Singers ceased to be supplied due to relations between you know, China and the West. But import replacements were soon forthcoming and within the space of 15 years, there were sewing machine factories in practically every province. The sewing machine is often treated as a discretionary, discretionary consumer item or a luxury item. And the art photo on the left here shows its romanticization in China in this vein. In China, however, it was a workhorse, at least until the 1980s. In propaganda, the sewing machine is overshadowed by the gun, the hammer and the sickle. There aren't any public awards for the heroic task of working the whole night through to clothe the family. It was possible for a woman to be employed in a clothing factory in the day and then to be fully occupied at night making clothes for her family. And for people who grew up in those decades, the sound of the sewing machine is a clear childhood memory. There are multiple records of that memory. So the sewing machine lightened women's load but it also supported the development of tailor-made clothing. They weren't very well tailored, but they were cut and basted and fitted in ways that were novel across much of China. The sewing machine came along with how to use a sewing machine booklets and what to sew. Uh, along with pattern books, these provided you know, the narrow range of uh, patterns that were used to make the clothing of these years. Pattern books were a characteristic genre of publishing in the Mao years. China was a pedagogical society, and in this period, when efforts were being made to create a productive society, how to books abounded, how to do this, how to do that, and pattern books were among them. Pattern books were core to the dissemination of skills needed for the making of the clothing worn in the new China. In the early 1950s, they were privately published, often crudely illustrated publications, produced largely for sewing schools. Later, they were increasingly standardized, written by research groups and later revolutionary committees produced in ever greater print runs in cities across China. This slide shows color and diversity in the designs. They're mostly from the early to mid fifties. The left hand, uh, the lower left hand black and white example from Canton <coughs> is a little bit more typical of what we will find in the sixties and seventies. These pattern books made available a view of contemporary clothing in which the foreground was occupied by the Zhong Shan, Shan suit. That is, nearly every pattern book begins with the Zhong Shan suit, and many more pages are devoted to it on average than to any other garment. One of the keys to producing this new clothing regime was learning how to measure up. The first handbook of Western tailoring produced in 1933, show, picture shown on the left here, was essentially about how to measure and the illustrations from that primer were still being reproduced in the 1950s. One thing that becomes apparent from a survey of the pattern books in this period is that the intimacy of contact between tailor and client posed a problem in, social, uh, in a social and political climate characterized by avoidance of sex. This was especially so if the tailor was male and the client female. Dressing the body in this environment was necessary um, 
necessitated providing instructions, but it pre presented graphic artists with a huge challenge. So the top right picture here shows us how this was managed in the early 50s by a Japanese tailor, uh, by a Japanese trained tailor in Shanghai. So a tailor is actually shown measuring up the man, but for measuring up the woman, we are shown only a pair of disembodied hands. Comparison of lessons in how to take a measurement over these decades shows that the challenge sometimes proved too much. The lower right-hand picture shows what written instructions also tell us. Measuring, especially of women, was often undertaken on the clothed body, not the naked or, or one or the one in underclothes. During the Cultural Revolution, images of women were occasionally admitted from pattern books altogether. Under these circumstances, the Jewful had virtually no competition because, of course, if the women weren't there, neither were, neither was the women's clothing. Most discussions of Chinese dress in this period are about women's dress. They focus on agency, gender roles, and identity. Very often in these discussions, there's pushback against the idea that during the Mao years, there was an absence of femininity or sexual awareness in dress. Photos are recovered from flea markets to show girls in dresses from times when, you know, we would suppose them all to be wearing jackets and trousers. And we might well end up thinking that after reading some of these that the idea of women all dressed the same in jackets and trousers was fundamentally wrong. On the other hand, and Tammy Barlow argues this and Julianne Noth, among others, that um, it's argued that red guard suits and militia uniforms were chosen by a cohort that rejected one way of being a woman, for example, woman in <coughs> Chong Sam, woman in Chipa, and adopting another. So I think these questions about choice, agency, wanting to look pretty are not uninteresting. They don't actually interfere with my thesis, that is, Mennonites and the Chinese could both be found to have distinctively feminine pretty clothes without the fact of the closed community being affected at all. But if we look at women en masse, then I think that wearing dresses and pretty clothes is not the obvious thing about what women wore in China in these years. What's obvious is the absence of those features, especially in public spaces. In other words, in scholarly works on dress, attention to difference often comes at the expense of attention to sameness. And I would like to talk about difference in sameness. In general, the trend in women's dress in this period was away from what was seen as either feudal or bourgeois or revisionist forms of clothing towards simple, frugal and neat dress. There were vicissitudes over time rather as in economic policy. But that was the general trend, supported by a Yenan ethic of hard work, simple lifestyle, and to some extent by poverty. From a distance, it could indeed seem as though everyone looked the same, as visitors often remarked, and people in China themselves remember it like this. I find, however, that first, Jewful for men and for women were always differentiated. Women never wore the high collar of the man's jewful. Their trousers were never fastened at the front. Their pockets never looked the same. Even at the more radical end of dress practices, the red guard uniform on the right hand side of the slide here, women's and men's dress were steadily drift differentiated. So the one that looks more martial more obviously military, is the men's. The woman's version looks just like, you know, a variation of the ordinary, you know, spring and autumn um, uh, dual function uh, jacket that was standard wear for uh, ordinary women in Chinese towns. And second, I find that Chinese style dress was coded as female. I mean here specifically jackets, although gowns could be included. Uh, 
That is, cheap hours lasted longer and they were more acceptable. They sometimes came back more acceptable than Chung Pa. As for Chinese style jackets, these continued to be in high demand by women, especially in winter. And we know this because there quickly came to be a shortfall in production, which generated uh, bureaucratic uh, correspondence that remains in the archives. From the 1950s through the 1980s, there were complaints about lack of stock in ready-made garments of this sort and a dearth of tailors skilled in making of them. If we look at how Chinese style jackets are made, we can see that their distinctive look is in fact underpinned by a distinctive uh, structure. The distinguishing characteristics of a Chinese style coat or jacket with a mandarin collar. With a mandarin collar, the style of buttoning and importantly, sleeves continuous from the body of the garment rather than separately cut and fitted, although hybrid styles might have fitted sleeves. So a side fashioning, fa fasten, fastening jacket looked old fashioned, rural and womanish and is usually found in rural contexts. As you can see from this photo, men did wear Chinese style jackets. They wore them in leisure, domestic, or retirement settings. Retired men wore it, wore it more often than men of working age. This domestic setting for men wearing the Chinese style jacket makes sense of the fact that it was otherwise widely worn by women, a fact well recognized in the industry. Although Chinese style was style, although Chinese style clothing was ubiquitous and could be worn by men as well as women, young and old, urban and free, urban and rural, it retained a strongly rural, tradi traditional, and domestic character that made it an ideal counterpoint to the jewel in any to the jewel in any of its forms. In its most concentrated form, the Jewful system shows a band of brothers, such as shown in this pattern book, dominating the sartorial landscape in their tailored coats, jackets, shirts and trousers, complete with leather shoes. The small space left for women might be occupied by just one or two iconic features. A young woman of married, marriageable age in her Chinese style jacket and a rural woman in her traditional side fastening top holding an infant in a padded winter cloak. And by presenting this very plain slide here, I have attempted to reproduce the scale in this particular pattern book of the representations, the full page patterns, the many full page patterns for men's uh, de dress for Drewful and the two tiny corner sketches provided for women's dress. The steady differentiation of men's from women's uh, dress calls attention to the problem of sexualized clothing in the Maoists. There was a campaign against outlandish clothing during the Cultural Revolution and actually beginning some years before, and it reveals a high level of alertness to the problem of sexualized clothing. So a short skirt that showed a girl's thighs, a dark single one under a white shirt that revealed a boy's torso, particular hairdos that gave a sense of attitude. All these styles were designed to give expression to something other than the valorized working body. The evident relationship of these styles to the sexuality of the wearers um, does prompt the question of how clothing in general was related to a human population that, like other human populations, was expected to procreate. And I do address this at greater length in the book. <laughs> 
I would like, however, briefly to call attention to the way in which strange clothing and outlandish dress, you know, a very powerful discourse in the 60s and 70s through to the 80s, how this was discursively associated with foreigners. In 1974-75, Mao's wife, Jiang Qing, tried to create a national dress for women. It was widely spooked at the time without becoming very popular. But after the fall of the Gang of Four, it was declared to be in the category of strange clothing and outlandish dress. And this poster uh, makes the connection of the discourse with foreigners very clear. It shows Jiang Qing in the company of her, of the journalist Roxanne Whitker, who interviewed her in the 70s and wrote, wrote a biography. The cartoon shows a not untypically racialized rendering of an American with a pointy red nose and obviously strange clothing and outlandish dress. This discourse worked internally as well as externally. It was a controlling discourse. It worked to control sex in the society, always a source of possible disorder and certainly a distraction from the proper point of attention and objects of love, uh, which were Mao himself and the party. Between the need to retain differences between male and female dress to preserve internal social order and to keep that differentiation within bounds so as to pre preserve the integrity of the closed community, the regime did have quite a balancing act to perform. It took a long time for this whole system to unwind. The last serious word on it was uttered by Hu Yaobang in an address delivered in 1983 when he uh, sounded the death knell of the discourse of strange clothing and outlandish dress and uh, himself donned a Western suit to set in train a process of change that despite his own dramatic removal from power would not be reversed. In a minor key, he managed to riff again on the old thing that when the dynasty changes, the clothing is altered. But you can see in this photo how he was well ahead of the pack in the middle of the 1980s. So briefly to conclude, does it make a difference talking about China um, as a cut off country as opposed to a closed community? And I feel we can distinguish between describing something, for example, a country is cut off and analysing it as, for example, a closed community. Community and country are by no means synonyms. Although with Benedict Anderson's imagined community, we can already see the associative pathway. The vast size of China makes the use of the term community counterintuitive. A community is notionally small scale. People know each other. But I believe this face-to-face -face aspect of community evoked by Anderson has to be transposed onto the imagined community in China, not as nation, but as renmin, uh, as the people. The renmin did have territorial limits. Not only... The, um, the black elements within Chinese society uh, who are not included uh, in it. Uh, also, sometimes people, sorry, let me, let me start again. Within Chinese society, people who were not the renmin, who were the class enemies, dressed up like the renmin. They dressed in this sort of clothing. Sometimes, also, people from outside coming in tried to make their way into this community by dressing just like the people, like the women. And examples are foreigners visiting the Canton Trade Fair in the early 1970s. Thinking about China as a closed community starts then to make sense of some of its features as systemat systematically connected. I would regard the control of Sino-foreign marriages as one sign of this system at work and dress practices as another. Dress practices weren't only a sign of, but a mechanism 
for the creation and maintenance of that community. Thank you.